Good morning. Good morning. It is a joy to be with you guys. Um, I bring greetings from West Virginia and a sister Sovereign Grace Church many miles away. Um, your, your first experience of a church, you know, you come in is worship, and it's just a relief and fun to come into a Sovereign Grace Church and know, I feel at home. I sing the same songs. I feel like I could be transplanted back to Sunday morning at my home and be worshiping with the people of God. So it's a joy to be with you. I've known about you guys for a while, actually, because we're not that big of a family in Sovereign Grace. Whenever you hear about church plants happening, word gets around, and we were excited to hear some, I guess, six years ago now when you guys planted. Um, but Bart was my first actual introduction to your church, so I don't know where Bart is. Had a great time. Here's what I noticed. That was, that was my first time teaching at the PC2, Bart's class. And about two days in, I realized this guy is in real tree camo every morning. <laughs> And I now feel at home. I am okay with this. So I felt an instant connection because Bart's got camo on and we get each other. So I had a great time. One of the places, all right, I can take a breath. There are people here that understand me. If I talk about hunting, Bart at least is going to look, look me in the eye and agree with me. Everybody else might be clueless because it was in the city. But uh, it was a good experience getting to know Bart a little bit. And it's a joy to come now actually be here with you on a Sunday morning. Uh, I had a great time at the men's conference. It was a wonderful conference. I had to spend with lots of your guys, gracious and loving and kind. Wait a minute, that was a different group of guys. Your guys were actually out back jeering at one another while they were throwing tomahawks, and I felt right at home. Had a great time uh, driving back, driving around. Basically, I didn't have a vehicle, so I was stuck um, parasiting off of all of your people for, uh, for three days, back and forth, and had a wonderful time. Uh, so it's a joy to be with you. It's a joy to share partnership in Sovereign Grace and know that we, uh, we're we a small corner of the kingdom, but this is our corner, and we get to link arms together and say, let's bring the gospel around. I was thinking, even as watching that video, thinking how exciting it is just to have a, a functioning local church, uh, preaching the gospel and living out the life of the church here. I think if I were to come back in a year or two years, who might be sitting here that's not here this morning, um, calling upon the name of the Savior because of a faithful local church? Um, and we get to do that and partner together, sometimes through missions, sometimes through sharing pulpits, sometimes just for praying for one another and knowing we're united by the same gospel and same beliefs. And it's a joy to be able to do that. And it's a joy now to be able to preach God's word to you. So if you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 46, preaching Psalm 46 this morning, there are some strong statements, bold words, that cannot survive the scrutiny of reality. Words that sound good in the moment they're uttered, but the hard, cold light of the real world makes them die. There might be no more famous historical example in the last hundred years or so than the words uttered by a Prime Minister of England in September of 1938, returning from a peace conference and saying, I believe there is peace in our time. The man was Neville Chamberlain. He had just been meeting with Adolf Hitler. In an earlier meeting of a couple weeks before, after coming back, he confided to his sisters in his diary that I believe Hitler is a man that can be relied upon to keep his word. He went back, made peace, came back. This is the second time in history, he said, that a representative of this government has come back from Germany with peace, with honor. I believe it is peace in our time. Within two years, the hard, cold light of reality would prove that statement stunningly false. It would take the blood, toil, tears, and sweat of another prime minister before England would ever be delivered from the threat that those bold statements put them in. And not to mention combat deaths and all that the war entailed, 58,000 of the ordinary citizens that this man proclaimed peace to would die in the bombing of their country by the man who could be counted on to keep his word. There are statements that sound good but die a slow death when faced with reality. To change the metaphor slightly, there, there are some words that sound sweet and reliable in the bright sunshine of the noonday, but they shrivel and turn to nothing when darkness falls. Now sadly, sometimes Christians make those kinds of statements. They have grains of truth in the kinds of things we say or put on cross-stitch pillows or paint on a board and put in our room. But unfortunately, those kinds of statements don't sustain saints. Things like, God will never give you more than you can handle. 
There's a grain of truth in that. The Lord is sufficient for everything. But, but that statement, if you will, has its eye not mostly on God, but mostly on us. And handle is a very subjective category. And there are times, if you chart, arc the trajectory of a faithful Christian life, when there will be things that feel like, I cannot handle this. This is too much for me. And a statement that sounds good in the sunshine turns bitter in your mouth in that moment. We say things like, when God closes a door, He opens a window. And yet, if you chart that same faithful Christian life, there will be times when it feels like all the doors close and there's no way out. If those are sacred cows, if those are in your home, don't go down and throw them in the trash. It's okay. But as I said, sacred cows don't sustain saints. There are some statements that aren't sufficient to bear the weight of a, of a real human life. But Psalm 46 this morning is going to make a very bold statement. It's going to make a statement, and then it's going to turn from that statement and look not at sunshine days and ro with rose-colored glasses on the world. It's going to look at the harshest moments of life and say, even if that takes place, this still remains true. You could put Psalm 46 in one sentence. No matter what comes, God will be our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. No matter what life holds, this will remain true. God will be this for us. And just a word, I, I love this psalm. Here's one of the reasons. I've preached this message twice. January of 2013, I preached this message as a New Year's Day message in our church with the theme, no matter what 2013 holds, God will be our refuge and strength. Within eight months of that year, my dad had a heart attack, multiple family emergencies had blown up, and my son was born with a genetic condition that landed us in the NICU, and then in multiple months, even years of surgery and treatment. He's doing much better now, but my life took a corner, turned a corner in 2013. It's never gone back around. Preach the psalm again this past January as our New Year's Day message. Because a Thursday night before that Sunday, I'd gotten a call from our senior pastor saying, we're doing another funeral this Sunday. Can you take the pulpit? Because I have to bury someone during service. In those five years, six years since that moment, and with all the saints through all time, here's a statement that can stand the test of reality. God will be and has been our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Let's pray, and then we'll look at this passage together, that this statement might stand through all eternity in our hearts and in our souls. Lord, we would ask now for your help as we come to your word. Father, would you let your word bear fruit in our lives? Lord, if there are those who, whose lives are shaking right now, would you be a refuge and a strength, a very present help, even this morning? And Lord, for all of us who look to a future that we do not know, would you give us an unshakable confidence in you, our refuge, our strength, and our very present help in trouble? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Verse 1 makes the statement of this psalm that we're going to say is our theme. This is the psalm. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And then in three, it's like, if this is a song, that's our chorus. And then in three verses, the psalm is going to pan across all of human experience and say, even in that, and that, and that, this remains true. So look with me first. We're going to look simply at that claim, God is our refuge and strength. And then we'll unpack those three stanzas or poetic verses, if you will. First, God is our refuge. If you had to put one word to what this human experience, this, this captures, it's this, being exposed. A refuge is what you need when you are exposed or vulnerable. Now, in our day and age, 
That's a bit of a difficult concept to grasp. Here's why. We are very rarely physically exposed ever. I know this has been a colder weekend than anybody expected, but the truth is we can go from one climate-controlled area to another, shivering in between, and then warming back up. We are almost never exposed to the elements. We can move from air conditioning to heat. If we need caffeine, there are Starbucks on every corner where we can get comfort in caffeine and warm us back up. But imagine hundreds and thousands of years ago, without all those convenience, what a refuge means. Having a refuge is a difference between life and death. It was said of mountain men in the days of settling the country that a good frontiersman never passed a good campsite without marking it. Because you might be back in that neck of the woods when a storm strikes, and if you don't know where to go, you're dead. We can begin, you put yourself in those circumstances, or imagine, for instance, in a long-term power outage. The sudden need for just simple physical refuge, something to protect you. Physically, that's hard to grasp, but probably, spiritually and emotionally, you do understand what that's like. To be vulnerable and exposed, it's a horrible feeling. All eyes are on me. I, I can't get away. I want to hide. And Psalm 46 says, when you're in that moment, God is your hiding place. When there's nowhere else that feels safe, God is the place you can turn and take refuge. It's striking in our day and age, even with all the comforts that we have, that these kinds of themes occur regularly. Maybe you've heard people talking, it's sort of a cultural buzz, about practices like meditation or mindfulness or things like that. They, they use words like centering yourself or grounding yourself or finding peace. In the Bible's language, those are emotional synonyms for refuge. That's not a categorical statement to say all those things are unbiblical. Here's what it is saying. If ultimately you turn to yourself or something you do to find that, it will fall short. But Psalm 46 proclaims, here's a refuge you can bank on always. God, when you are vulnerable, he will keep you safe. Then the next word, God is our refuge and he is our strength. If vulnerability meets us when we are exposed, strength meets us when we're powerless. When you cannot do anything else, when you have, you would say, it is not within my power to, God will grant you power. And everyone needs that kind of power. Now, it's striking when you think about it. We carry around a living illustration of powerlessness, and most of us probably in our pockets. I have one right here. It has a little marker up in the corner. I'll be traveling later today. You notice these things cropping up in airports called charging stations. Why? Because this is a ticking clock, and the, the meter will begin to shrink. We'll show percentages are just different colors. You are almost out of power. We're dependent on power to plug back in and recharge. And the world is all about power, but here's what Psalm 46 says. All the world's power heaped up is like 1% of battery remaining, and the world squabbles over it like it's the energy of a sun. And yet God for his people is strength unending. Power that has literally no limits. Now, to steal a look ahead, this is this power, this strength that God offers. It's power that carries its own purposes. It's not simply, I'll let you do anything you want. It's, it's power directed. Verse 2 says, power for this, so you don't fear. It's power that enables the people of God to look life square in the face. I will not fear, because God is my strength. I will not be afraid. God is with me. When we are exposed, God is our refuge. When we are powerless, God is our strength. And lastly, God is our help. A very present help in trouble. This is Psalm 46's bold claim. Help deals with being alone. 
Now, if you're a parent of a small child, alone might be the sweetest word in your vocabulary, a moment which no one is calling for me. And if you're an introvert, being alone doesn't sound bad, it sounds good. But when being alone means I called for help and no one answered, being alone is terrifying. And Psalm 46 says, when you are alone, the Lord is your help. Literally, it says he is help in troubles greatly to be found. He's not far off. You must search for him when troubles come. He is right there, greatly to be found, easily to be found. He's instantly there when help is necessary. Psalm 90 will put it this way. Oh Lord, you have been our dwelling place from all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you have been our dwelling place. Quite literally, before there were mountains to fall apart, as the rest of the psalm was going to describe, God was planning to be your refuge, your strength, and your help. There has never been a moment, if you were a Christian, when God did not have his eye on you and know, I will be there for them no matter what. I will never leave you or forsake you. That's the bold statement Psalm 46 makes. No matter what comes, God is our refuge, our strength, our very present help in trouble. But it would be one thing to make that statement and then plunge our heads in the sand. To slam the door against life, dead bolted and hide so that nothing can shake our confidence. But Psalm 46 is not going to do that. Psalm 46 is going to go with almost daring, audacious boldness and look at the things that would threaten that statement and then say, it's still true. So in the first verse, if you will, the first stanza, the psalm turns in pans towards an earth shaking. Verse 2. Therefore we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar in foam, though its, the mountains tremble at its swelling. Here's the theme of this first stanza. God will be your refuge and strength because he is unchanging in the midst of change. God is unchanging in the midst of all kinds of change. Now the psalm starts with, therefore we will not fear. But it doesn't go on then to small fears. Therefore we will not fear, though we get a little grayer and a little heavier as time goes on. Now it looks at, devastating circumstances. Though the earth be turned upside down, therefore we will not fear. Now, I have never lived through an earthquake. Well, real earthquakes. You know, every once in a while, in 35 years, we've had like one of those times it shakes and the pictures tilt a little bit and everything. What was that? A big truck going by? Or, but not a real earthquake. I can imagine, though, being in that kind of earthquake would feel like an act of betrayal. What's the ground's job? Stay put. That's all you have to do. Just stay there. That's the assumption behind every building project. You put a foundation firmly on the ground, and the building will stay put because the ground stays put. And then an earthquake strikes. And the thing that's supposed to be stable moves. And that's not good. There are physical earthquakes, and there are spiritual earthquakes in which the thing you never even had to give a second thought to suddenly shakes and perhaps comes toppling down. Psalm 46 invites you and says, look at that. Just for a moment, don't speculate, don't spend your life in that future, but, but if it's in your mind now, if that happens, that thing, God will still be unchanging. If the things change that you can't imagine changing, God will still be the same. So therefore, you cannot fear. You can say, if all shakes, God will hold me fast. It's an invitation to consider for a moment. We've been taught well in our family of churches by the statement, there's no grace for speculation. You don't just spend all your time living in the future. But Psalm 46, for this moment, says you, you have that thing. 
that you can't even bear to think about. The earth falling into the sea, worlds being turned up down. And for a moment, just know this, if it comes, God won't change. If it comes that everything shakes, he's not shaken. God is unchangeable when everything else changes. That's the first proclamation of Psalm 46. We know God is our refuge, strength, and present help because even if everything else is upended, He's the same. He's never changed. Nothing will shake Him. And then the psalm moves on in verses 5 to 6 to yet another stanza. Let's read verses actually 4 through 7. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The second stanza proclaims this. God will be your refuge, your strength, your help. Because God is present with his people. He's unchanging when everything else changes. Now he is present with his people. A little bit like the first thing, you almost have to read it backwards to know what exactly is going on. We begin in verse 4. The scene before is chaos. Now everything seems at peace. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. This is a happy city. Why are they happy? Verse 5 tells us because God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Unlike the mountains, though they might be thrown into the heart of the sea, this city will never be moved. This city's not going anywhere. Why? Because God will help her. But that raises the question, why would this city need help? And there's only one phrase that tells us why. Verse 6, the nations rage. Here's the imagery. A besieged city ringed by raging nations. Raging nations has been a theme in the Psalms all the way from chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? There are always people who are hostile to God's people and God's purposes. And this second stanza turns the camera, if you will, on that city of God and all around are enemies. But inside there's gladness and joy. Why? Because God is on the inside of the city. Now, like we said earlier with the concept of refuge, it might be hard in our modern day and age to imagine what a besieged city is like. I was thinking, it's almost probably physically and technologically impossible to completely cut off a city in our day and age from the outside world. You'd have to shut down every wireless signal, every cell tower, no inside communication. There's almost no way to prevent someone, even in a closed country, from getting somehow word of the outside world, but not in the ancient day. If you put armed men all the way around the city, no one gets in and no one gets out. When you're besieged in that circumstance... All help is limited to who's inside the city. You have no outside resources. That's the picture of this second stanza. But surprisingly, those people besieged by enemies all around are happy. Why? Armies outside, God inside. Battle one, story over. God is with his people. And God will help him. Help her, this city, the city of God, the church of God, the people of God. When morning dawns, God will help. It's surprising that really the enemies only get at best two phrases. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, everything else is God. He speaks, the earth shakes, enemies are done, end of story. He gives gladness and joy to his people. But the enemies, they're there, they just don't count because God is on the other side. It's a remarkable statement, but... But there's something I think that we need to consider closely in this. There's good news in here for hurting saints. Because notice that particular phrase, God will help her when, when morning dawns. Now again, put yourself in a pre-digital, pre-modern era. How do you know when morning comes? Only when morning comes. You have no way to check the time and say, it's 5.45, I can't see, but in 15 minutes, I know it's happening. There's just two kinds of time, darkness and the morning. 
And the darkness in that circumstance can sometimes be very long. But notice the assertion, before morning, God is with her. Before morning, when the help of the Lord comes, God is present with his people. How do you know? You have to wait until morning to find out. I can't help but think whenever I read this part of Psalm 46 of the scene from J.R. Tolkien's The Two Towers when he leaves his, his friends in the Battle of Helm's Deep and tells them, look for me at first light on the fifth day. You have to wait until then. Help won't come until later. Now it's dark. But God's with you. But you have to wait for it to be proved. Are you in darkness this morning? Perhaps it's just in one area of life where you say, I, I have prayed about this, and it doesn't go away. It just feels like there's no light for this struggle, this prayer request. Here's what Psalm 46 tells you. Right now, God is with you. And when morning dawns, you'll see his help. So keep waiting. Now, it's a, it's a striking phrase for yet another reason. Because at another time in Israel's history, they had to wait for the morning. In Exodus 14, when they are delivered from their greatest Old Testament enemy, they go into the Red Sea, and apparently throughout day and night, the, the people of Israel are passing through this sea. And the hosts of Pharaoh follow behind. And God tells Moses, now, stretch out your hand. And here's literally what the text says, 1427, stretch out your hand, and Moses did so, and the waters returned to their normal courses when the morning dawned. God was with you all through the night. He was preparing a deliverance, but imagine walking through and thinking, this isn't going to work. They're just going to come right behind us and kill us. And then morning comes, and God delivers his people. He was there all along, but you see it when the morning light shines. If you're in the dark, hold fast. Stand firm. When morning comes, you will see his help. Throughout life, throughout life following the Lord, there, there will be many times of darkness and then joy that comes in the morning. But ultimately, all of God's people are waiting one bright resurrection morning when the help of the Lord will be made crystal clear and all will see he really was with us. He really did have a plan that leads all the way until all of us are home. God is our refuge, our strength, our very present help in trouble. When all else changes, He's unchanging. When enemies ring around, He's present with us. And last stanza, beginning in verse 8. God, this God is unstoppable in His plans. Verse 8 begins this way. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes the wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God is unstoppable in his plans, Psalm 46 proclaims. Now, it's a strange invitation, isn't it? You begin in verse 8. Come behold the works of the Lord. What has he done? He has desolated the earth. You've got to put this in the right context. This is not, for instance, a Genesis 1, God seeing all that's very good and then changing his mind saying, I'm done with it. This is a Genesis 3, 4, and all the other chapters, context, in which God looks out on a hostile planet filled with brothers killing brothers. Abusers, oppressors, enslavers, disease, death, and the whole sordid mess that is man in rebellion against God. God looking out and saying, that is done. I have allowed it to persist for long enough, and now I will bring a stop to it. God is making war, but he is making war to make peace. Verse 9 says, he has is, he is broken the power of the enemy to do anything more. Their bows are snapped. Their spears are shivered and shattered into pieces. 
The chariots that they use to dominate and oppress the earth, they're burning. The world is a battlefield and the Lord is one. And then verse 10. Now we may be hitting another sacred cow here. We are not helped by all the coffee mugs and gentle pictures of quiet pastoral scenes with be still and know that I am God on it. That's not the context for this. This is not God saying, take a chill pill and relax and know that I am God. This is the anthem that drowns out all music but its own. The voice that's heard around the world. Stop! That will cease now. I am God. And all the would-be lords and pretenders call for the mountains to fall upon them, to hide them from this God. He's come. He's the real king. Hide. What will we do? Psalm 46, here, cast our gaze all the way to the end and says there will be a day when all God's enemies who ring all of God's people around and besiege them, they will quake in their boots and they will be brought low because the king will come and say, now let it be known, I am God. I and no other. I am the Lord. Be still. Cease. Stop. And then that lovely assertion, that Lord, the Lord of hosts, He's with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. On that day when the Lord who is unstoppable in His plans brings them all to the end, we will not be calling upon the mountains to fall upon us. By the mercy of God, we will be able to look at the King of kings and Lord of lords and say, He's with us. He's our fortress. He's on our side. What a marvel. God is our refuge and our strength. Our very present help in trouble. When all changes, He doesn't change. When all is hostility, He's there. When all plans seem to be going astray, His plans are unstoppable. The morning will dawn. The time will come when it will be clear God is the Lord and there are no rivals to the throne. But now, there's one last question. One last thing we need to consider from this text. Perhaps you've had this question. How do I know now? How do I really know that that great cosmic morning will dawn. You haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Are we just left waiting and waiting with nothing to sink our teeth into than the bare hope that one day it will change? What will it look like? How will we know when God exalts himself? When God does this act by which all the nations will know is it only that day? And that question takes us from verse 10 beyond Psalm 46. Verse 10, look at it again. Be still and know that I am God. This will be the act, this will be the moment when the lordship of the Lord will be proclaimed. How he will be exalted among the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. Now that, that's a good translation, but you could also translate that. In fact, the Greek translation of the Old Testament does he will be lifted up among the nations. He will be lifted up in the earth. That, that's the idea behind exaltation. You stand above everyone else. You are higher. God has lifted himself up so that all see God and know he is God. And that takes us to a very different scene. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 12. If we've been reading through John's gospel, we... We have this sense that we're waiting on something to happen. Jesus makes statements over and over through John's gospel like this. My hour is not yet. My hour is not here. It is not my hour. So we're waiting, Jesus. What will it be like when whatever this hour is comes? And in John 12, midway through the chapter, something happens. Greeks, non-Jews, translate that, the nations representatives from people who don't belong in the tribe of Judah. They come and they ask the disciples, we would see Jesus. 
And Jesus is told, and here's what he says, verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The moment that we've been waiting for for 11 chapters, it's now. And what does it look like? Verse 27, it's an hour that troubles Jesus. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Now think what we have here. The nations have come. We have a voice that sounds like a thunder proclaiming, I will glorify my name. And what does Jesus say? I will be lifted up. And all people will see and be drawn to me. What kind of death will the Son of Man die? He will die a lifted up death. In the sight of all the nations. And that death will be the means by which God glorifies himself and exalts himself in the sight of all people. But make no mistake. That moment, that passive death is God doing battle. God goes to war to bring all of his purposes to completion. How? First, by making war upon his son. By striking his son in the place of all his people so God can say to them, I am your refuge. I am your strength. The Lord Jesus is struck down so that we do not have to bear the blow of God. And in that death lifted up, God has exalted himself and made clear, I am God. Who else would come up with this plan to rescue the people of God? How else would the nations know that God is both holy, gracious, and merciful? And God strikes his son and lifts him up for all to see. Of all the things Psalm 46 considers, the earth being shaken, all the things that the people of God might grow through. There's one thing you and I will never face. The earth-melting voice of the Lord saying, condemned to death. Looking you in the eye and saying, your transgressions are marked against you. Get thee from my sight. Because in this moment, the Lord strikes his son so that he can look us in the eye and say, I'm your refuge. I'm your strength. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Now I can't pass that without simply asking, have you heard that voice? Have you heard the Lord addressing you by name and calling you son or daughter? Sometimes it takes many weeks and months to recognize God is after me. And I need to bend my knee. Sometimes it's a decisive moment, maybe even sitting in a sermon this morning, you realize, I am rebelling against the one who will bring the earth to its completion, whose purposes can't be stopped. I have set myself against him, and there is nowhere else to go. Hear the gracious invitation of the Lord this morning. Come to Jesus. Hear the one who should cause you to fall to your knees and cry, hide me from the face of this one, saying, come, I'll give you rest. I'll be your refuge, your strength. All you have to do is the simple act of repenting and believing. Turns your world right side up, but all that's required is, I believe, Lord. And the voice of the Lord that shakes the world will tell you, you're my son, you're my daughter. Call upon me as your father. And for every one of us who has put our trust in Christ, Here's what the scriptures say. The Lord of hosts is with us. 
the God of Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is our fortress. Though all else changes, he will not change. Though enemies surround us, morning is coming. He is unstoppable in his plans, and one day every saint will see. You were there. You were there through the night, and you have brought me into the inheritance that Jesus won for me. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is and ever shall be our fortress. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are our refuge and our strength. We thank you that no matter what changes, no matter what the future holds, you know you'll be there and you won't change. And Lord, we pray for those this morning who perhaps are, are in a season where the waiting seems like the only thing they can do. Lord, would you let them know you were with them and that morning is coming. May we take refuge in you, our strength and our fortress and our help. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.